Nilan from City Power, Joburg again. Um, I've got a question for Numfunda, please, regulator. Can you clarify for us what the one megawatt limit applies to? Is it per property, per, cup, uh, per customer, per low voltage supply? Um, we're not quite sure of that. Um, and then I've got to ask, the, the under one megawatt apparently doesn't count towards the RP. Is that going to cause a problem for us in the future? Because I think the uptake is going to be very rapid. And you might very quickly get to a gigawatt, and then we've got problems. So I think maybe the question is, what criteria would trigger your refusal to register? So is there a threshold that we, we should expect? And then the question I've got for Dr. Carter Brown, if tomorrow we declared the Joburg grid completely open to renewable energy, so anybody can put on and they can trade across the network, et cetera, et cetera. At what sort of limit would we expect to have problems? Um, you know, if I consider our prospect power island, we've got 750 MVAs worth of capacity at the 275 kV level. At 88 to 11, we've got one and a half gigawatts. Down at the mini sub, just that power island alone has three gigawatts worth of transformer capacity. Should we expect problems here, or can we absorb a huge amount of power? Thanks. Thank you. Um, nice and sweet. Um, take the lady in front here. Just say your name and okay. to whom. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Imani. Um, I report for the Pioneers Post. Um, so the question I have is that we've heard from a lot of speakers like Africa Power that SSGs, um, the challenges that they faced are regarding funding. So I want to find out from the banking and fin finance sector, um, what interventions does NetBank have in place to deal with those challenges? Thank you. Yeah, difficult questions. Um. Hi, Richard Worthington. I'm with Civil Society. Uh, okay. Two-part question for the regulator, um, and it's related to the IRP. So currently, you showed us a slide from the IRP that was published last year. There's a changed version that is now sitting with the National Economic Labor and Development Council, and um, which has got provisions for storage that weren't in before. It's got more for coal-fired power, and it's got considerably more for embedded generation. I believe it's 500 megawatts a year for three to five years, but it, it's not in the public domain, so I'm not exactly sure what's provided for there. The question is, will NERSA be getting another bite at the apple on this IRP process? Are you expecting to? Is it a stipulation that you will? Or, or is um, NERSA's engagement on this process concluded, given that it's now with NEDLAC and thereafter expected to go to Cabinet? And secondly, what is the purpose of NERSA's engagement? Um, in other words, are you in a position to impact on the substance of it? I ask this for example, with the retirement schedule of ESCOM. So what we need now, and in the short term, very much depends on what ESCOM's available fleet can do. What is in the IRP has been all over the place, and it keeps changing between drafts, and it still shows us retiring Hendrina from 2020, when we know it's largely shut down already. Is that the sort of thing that NERSA can say we need greater clarity in the IRP on what we can expect from the available generation fleet of ESCOM. Okay, the last set, um, last on this set. Thanks, it's Richard from UV. The question is to the regulator, please, with two questions. The first is that the, um, as you discussed earlier, projects are being registered under one megawatt on the basis of the no November 2017 Schedule 2. In the meantime, a new schedule has been published for comment and registration processes have been published by uh, NERSA or on NERSA's website. Can you please comment on the extent to which they are in any way in, in force, since they are all to some extent um, different from each other? The uh, second question relates to the extent to which uh, NERSA is um, considering what is supposed to be a very large retroactive number of applications for generation licenses, or whether you started with new applications um, in the sub one megawatt category and the one to 10 megawatt category. Thanks. Okay, thank you. We've got more than uh, six questions, so well about there. Okay, um, the first was uh, to, to 
to Nessa. Nessa is very popular today. I think you can speak from there, that should be fine. Thank you. Um, the question from City Power regarding uh, one megawatt, the way that we have uh, looked at it, uh, we look at it in terms of the facility itself, the generator that you are using. So the amount that, that can be generated with uh, the, f the, f the, the technology that you have installed. So if you look at the documents, including the, <clears throat> the, the procedures that we have designed, you will see that it makes specific reference to the facility. So when we talk about the operation. I can hear you. So um, when we talk about, uh, remember we're talking about the operation. What you license or register is the operation of generation or distribution or transmission. So in this respect, the generator, when we talk about that megawatt, we talk about the generator that you would have installed in that distribution network or the distribution system. So how much it is at that point. So if you're adding up, you're putting uh, two more and they exceed, then that's something else, if they exceed to one megawatt. So uh, the specific reference then is on the, on the, um, the generator that then generates uh, that amount of megawatts. Okay, um, in terms of uh, the criteria for refusal to register, uh, well, uh, we, we, we want to say that it is a first come first serve because we have not, there's no, there's no reservation capacity kind of thing, if I may use that loose term. You know, it will be a first come first serve. When we receive the, uh, the applications, we will then um, um, register them as long as they comply with the requirements, as long as the application uh, complies. The ones uh, below the one megawatt, you just have to make sure that all the things that we have specified, including the registration fee, and you have applied using the form itself that is approved, and also um, you've got the connection letter, whether from the municipality or ESCOM or wherever. So if all you have all of that and it is below one megawatt, uh, that will be registered. However, uh, there's a part about uh, if you are company X, you have done your uh, below one megawatt elsewhere. What if you do another one in another uh, location, right? And then you add the two and they give you like three megawatts or so. So that then it, it is something else. It will not fall under registration because it's still the same company. So you've got one, you've, loc you've located it here and it, below, it is below one megawatt. And then you've got another one elsewhere. So if you combine the two, and then what, 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 what then happens, you know? Um, so so that, that, that is what we, are, we will consider as well in terms of uh, one company looking into registering the activity. Remember, the registration is one option. You've got another one, which is licensing. So if it is above one megawatt, you will then be looking at licensing, not registration. So that is why we are saying if you've got two generators and the two generators, they generate more than one megawatt, then you are no longer under the registration. Then the licensing uh, requirement will kick in. I'm not sure if I'm, I've answered the question, but if we are looking at uh, something that is more than that. Okay, <clears throat> and uh, I think uh, Dr. Kata Brown, you had one? Yeah, thanks Paul. Um, so, yeah, it's how long is a piece of string in terms of how much you can embed. Um, depends on a number of factors. Um, firstly, very different uh, for your different consumer classes. So if you're a, a daytime shopping mall, uh, you can probably embed a lot of PV with very little net export back into the grid. Most of that energy is going to be used in the local <laughs> operations um, and the grid impacts in those kinds of daytime electricity user grids is, is, is relatively low. Um, the uh, challenge is uh, more pronounced in things like the domestic market. Um, most of us, well, we're here now, we're not at home. Um, a lot of our appliances aren't running. It's a very peaky early morning and late evening or early evening peak. Um, and a lot of the PV, if you don't couple it with storage, then exports into the grid. And those are relatively low capacity grids. Um, and there's a high level of what we call 
correlation in terms of when the sun shines, all of those PVs produce simultaneously. So uh, it does, does start to cause some challenges for the distribution grid, um, but it can all be solved, and we could actually absorb relatively large levels of concentration of embedded SSEG, but it will require different approaches, different standards, different operations, um, and uh, our, our aging and what we would call a dumb distribution grid would need to start to progressively become much smarter. Um, and there are really a number of utilities in the world that are well progressed with that. Uh, you need to have increased le levels of visibility, your voltage control needs to be done uh, more intelligently, your protection and relaying and coordination needs to be done properly. So it, it does require um, a more um, IT savvy and, um, uh, and how shall we say, a, 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 a very um, agile utility um, to be operating in that environment. It's no longer the old distribution fit and forget business of installing the mini sub and only ever going you know back if there's an issue or problem with it um, you, you need to have um, far, far more levels of visibility and control can all be done um, and uh, but a lot of those challenges really only start to incur at fairly relatively high levels we're far away from that um, and, and just a point on that we have a as a CSR we have a a joint um, program with uh, the GIZ Sajin, um, providing uh, uh, support to municipalities with other partners like SEA. Um, and one of those work packages is in doing grid study support to selected municipalities where we're assisting them um, with actually analyzing a number of these applications and helping them get their processes and their technical standards and criteria in place. Um, so that as customers apply, that the municipality is well capacitated to be able to allow these connections to happen responsibly. Okay. Um, the one question that was uh, um, asked to uh, NetBank, um, we'll deal at the end. Let's deal with the, um, the next one, which was around, why are you engaging as NERSA, I think it was. And there was, um, yeah, the same person was asking the same. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, you'll recall that the uh, the development of the IRP um, uh, it is in terms of Section 34 as well and is mentioned in the Electricity Regulations Act. So, so there's a legal mandate there for consultation, for NERSA's consultation. So, um, so it is important to consult with NERSA, but the extent of uh, the substance into the IRP um, obviously, there's a bit of a challenge there because uh, you're dealing with the policymakers and we're not policymakers, so you always uh, get to be reminded that we don't design policy, or, uh, obviously, policy uh, measures. So what we can do, we simply input so that we don't come right at the end of the process itself. Uh, sometimes your, your wish list uh, may find its way into the IRP, sometimes it may not find its way into the IRP because you simply provide input and they may decide what they want to achieve. So we provide what we provide, sometimes we see some of the things that we have guided on, uh, included, some of them are not there. But at this stage, um, we have not in, uh, finalized our engagements with the department in, uh, with regards to the IRP that is currently before NETLEC, the one that um, has been revised recently. We have had uh, engagements early in the year, and we're supposed to have follow-up engagements. We're just informed about the changes, but we're supposed to have follow-up engagements on the one that is before NETLEC. So from our side, we haven't really um, um, contributed to the one that is currently before NETLEC. And we still had uh, some questions, so we agreed with the department that we will have further engagements on that one. So that's where it, we stand on that one. So the, uh, the last question with regards to, um, uh, I th I'm not sure whether we're talking about the licenses uh, for the uh, for the, for the, for those that are be beyond one megawatt, um, you know the letter of the minister is not open ended, and this is something that we have been debating and then looking into it very carefully, and it's quite important. Uh, does it mean that when they say when it says that NERSA can now consider applications? Uh, for those that are above one megawatt, does it mean that new applications altogether that we must start looking at? 
it seems uh, well that that's so far the sort of the interpretation. It seems it refers to those that um, have been uh, in the pipeline or they've been uh, provided or submitted to NERSA. It may not be that they are um, um, compliant applications, like in terms of all the information that is required. Because it seems it goes back retrospectively to consider those. It doesn't uh, you know, look forward to say, start others, you open up the, you know, the, the new applications, but it is something that we are still looking at in terms of looking at the language of the letter itself whether it's an open-ended. We also looked at uh, whether the letter um, has some exclusions as well to say, you must not do this, who's supposed to apply, who's not supposed to apply. Um, do you also allow municipalities to come forward as well and install their own generators, right? So those were the kind of things that we're asking ourselves because it is not there in the letter. So, so the letter, it, you know, it's very short. It doesn't deal with certain things. So, and then the language of the letter. So you look at every word. What does it mean? So we still need to engage with the department there just to get clarification and also their understanding on that. So it's quite important before we as NERSA can say we cannot do this or we can do this and you find that that was not what is in the mind of the policymakers. Are you done? Okay. Um, there is then the, the last question that needed to be answered. Um, uh, is Duncan in the house? Um, <clears throat> Duncan Abel? Yeah. Okay. Can you please help the young lady here? With you? Just thank you. Um, just by way of introduction, um, yeah, name's Duncan Abel. I work in the Ned Banks Energy Finance Business Unit, uh, specifically looking at sort of funding embedded generation projects. Um, maybe to start off, and just to sort of split up um, when we talk about funding. I mean, the first part is sort of direct lending to um, a client. Um, so any one of you or any company who's looking to buy a solar system. Um, and in that space, I mean, there are multiple touch points in the bank from sort of residential where, I mean, the simplest, easiest way to do it is just to put it onto your mortgage loan. Um, you've got long-term funding, which is probably cheaper than any other funding that you can get. Um, the same sort of thing as you, as, as, as sort of companies or, or entities start getting sort of larger. We've got some specific sort of term loan facilities in our business banking unit um, in support of our sustainable development goals initiatives. Uh, we've extended tenors on loans out to 10 years. Um, with the, the objective of trying to make um, sort of solar projects or renewable energy projects cash flow negative, or sorry, cash flow positive sort of from day one, uh, where the, the cost of the loan is less in the savings that you're making from, from installing the facility. One, once we get sort of past sort of self-funding or, or sort of own projects, moving into the, um, the sort of small-scale IPP or independent power producer projects, things do get a bit more complex and a bit more um, sort of costly as well. Um, this is where we are funding a developer who's going to build a project on, 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 your, on your premises and then sell you power um, at a rate cheaper than you're currently buying from either ESCOM or from the, from the municipality. Um, there we've developed or we started off developing portfolio um, sort of financing uh, structures um, only to find out that nobody had a portfolio of, of projects in South Africa and have adapted that to, to, um, sort of to, to more a pipeline sort of funding facility. Um, in the last couple of months, we've probably financed or made funding available to just over a billion rands worth of projects to two developers. Um, and these are all projects in the list of the less than one megawatt, um, the one, one megawatt, megawatt scale. So typically you're looking at, I don't know, 80 to 100 megawatts of projects that will be funded through this, I mean, I mean through this, this structure over the next two, well, the next two years. And we're likely to try and sort of double this, I mean, double our, our sort of available funding over the next year or so. Um, where these, where this does get a bit more complex is with the costs involved, we're, we're looking at portfolios, we're looking at um, sort of spreading those costs across a portfolio. Obviously, it's incredibly difficult if you've got a small project, which in the PV space typically costs about 10 million rand for one megawatt, um, to put, a, put off an off-balance sheet structure in place for that. Uh, the legal costs involved, the technical due diligence involved, our own fees, etc., are probably going to 
probably going to make the, the project not economically viable. So it's important for us to find developers who've got pipelines of projects um, and pipelines where there's sort of a reasonable level of assurance that that pipeline is actually going to materialise um, over a, over a two-year, 18-month sort of period. Um, so we have found, as I said, we found two developers so far who sort of meet those criteria. We do think the market is slowly opening up. We do think uh, with the the NURSA regulations, it's a it's a I mean it's a big step in the right direction. Um, the barrier that we're still finding though is how the municipalities or the or the um, distributors, including ESCOM, actually link into um, into that process. Um, we've got one of our own projects where. It's a small 350 kilowatts, so roughly three and a half, four million rand installation, um, where the initial quote was 450,000 rand to get a grid connection. Over four or five months of negotiation, that's down to 80,000 rand. We're still not quite sure what we're getting for the 80,000 rand, um, but the and and the the next step is probably just to pay it. And, and sort of move move to getting sort of registered. So so it's that, I mean, it, although sort of the nursery regulations are a big step in the right direction, there's this the part before you can get to getting registered or getting licensed, which is which is causing delays upwards of, I don't know, a year, 18 months, sort of two year delays we, we're finding in the industry. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, don't ask difficult questions again. Okay, uh, there was a, a hand here. Um, I'm seeing a hand here and one at the back and one on the side is the fourth one. And the one in the middle here. Let's start here and we'll do that. Um, okay, she already has a mic. So, yeah. uh, Good morning, everyone. My name is Jenna Levagna from Sonani Energy. And I have a question for Ms. Massetti regarding the registration process. Almost a bit of a follow on from what Duncan was speaking about now. Has NURSA engaged with the various NSPs as to that letter that you spoke about that's required to initiate the NURSA registration process? Um, from what I understood from the presentation, I think it was the 26th of May, it was a Friday presentation by NURSA, which was excellent, and outlined all the requirements and the steps in the process, is that the ideal requirement is actually a use of system agreement, but NURSA understands that it takes a very long time uh, to actually sign with all the parties. So uh, the entities that I've engaged with in terms of NSPs to get this letter to NURSA to initiate the registration process, they don't know what it is exactly, or there's no template. Some do, some don't, and I just wanted a bit of clarity on that. Uh, sorry, and then another question, sort of a follow-up from City Power. I'm not sure if it should be Dr. Clinton Carter-Brown or Ms. Massetti. In terms of the limitation on the installed SSEG, so below one megawatt, is there any engagement with the ESCOM system operator in terms of national stability on solar PV particularly installed in our country? Okay, two questions there. There was one. Thanks, Chair, and thanks to NetBank for the coffee. <laughs> um, my name is Silas Zimu. I'm from the Africa Energy Corporation. You know, Chair, in, in October 2017, I publicly notified the country that ESCOM and municipalities will never be the same again. And I was criticized. So today, we're having a session where it's now real. Uh, and I'll give a solution to the municipalities and ESCOM. Firstly, to NERSA. You know, no, it's not a difficult question. <laughs> Sissy, if you say, bring a letter from ESCOM or municipality, what if they delay? Because you also said, they are saying their revenues may be negatively impacted, which may be true. But I'm arguing that their energy purchases to ESCOM and ESCOM coal purchases should reduce, which, which then should be a saving on them. So where they used to make three billion a year, they'll make 1.5, but that doesn't mean it's a loss. It's directly proportional to what they've purchased, okay? So why do they have to give that letter? They're gonna frustrate people, that's one. CSIR, in your model, you have municipalities to do their own embedded generation as well. I, I, I also s believe that ESCOM should be added in that, otherwise they're gonna lose out big time. 
So if you look at what's happening in Singapore, look at what's happening in, in, in uh, Japan, uh, Portugal, utilities are actually the ones that are distributing these technologies. It's not small individuals like Silas. They are actually partnering with people like Silas. So in Zulu we say, Walala wasala, Mr. Fermielen. If you sleep, you're not going to wake up. The people, customers are going to go away. If I look at some of the people that are here that are already doing their work, taking customers from you, your customer service is going to close down. So, uh, Chris, we just need to say to ESCOM, get into the game. Don't let the game get away from you. Sabvia, the energy center has to be part of it. We're not manufacturing solar panels as yet, in principle. Okay, you can talk about those that are shutting down. But the energy center must be forced to be part of this. Power Africa. Rural areas, do they have challenges like we have in our townships where people cannot afford the price of electricity? Uh, what, what's your experience? Are you are doing this for free or somebody's paying? Are they subsidized like in Europe? So, uh, Paul Fermielen, my proposal is that let City Power be part of this, identify customers, work with the private sector, because you don't have the finances anyway, and Treasury will never pick you up. Thank you. Jonathan from Ubuntu Energy. Two very easy questions. Um, the first one is on the Sapphire PV green card, which I started looking at two weeks ago, and I'm very interested in it. My question is, is the card registered to a company or to a person? The reason for the question is I've been doing technical design on solar for 11 years, so I could pass day one very, very easily, but I don't get up on the roof and physically install. But my installer is a master electrician, and he would pass day two very easily, but he looks to me to put the technical design together, so he would fail day one. So I want to know, does that exclude me because we would not get past the assessment to get a PV card, or would the two of us together with both of our expertise allow us to get a PV card? And then uh, my second question is, um, I think it's gonna fall into the NURSA um, sort of answering, is that my master electrician doesn't want to issue the electrical COC for residential installation that we have done because he says that we have to first register uh, the PV plant, which is only for self-consumption, with the municipality first. And I am saying, well, shouldn't the municipality actually want to see an electrical COC to know that it's been installed first before the process? So him and I are having a disagreement in terms of which comes first, the registration or the electrical CRC. Thank you. Thank you. Good student. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I will ask one question. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, with this whole process of change, transitioning to... So, uh, what's your name? Love Mochili Manze from a company called Africa Green Call. Okay. It's an intermediary of Tega. Um, this whole transition of um, energy supply and the proliferation of different uh, technologies, th there's definitely some opportunities that, was, that will start arising, business opportunities, if I may call it that. For example, uh, you, you could end up with now brokers or intermediaries finding opportunities in the market. And uh, those opportunities may bring in uh, technical and economic efficiencies, and probably even crowding more capital for actualizing uh, uh, projects. Um, my question will go to, to, to NESA. How prepared are we for, I don't want to call it eventuality because I know already there are some organizations that are already in this kind of field in South Africa. But last time when I checked, there was no explicit regulation around that kind of activities. Those activities are not irrelevant. If anything, they enhance uh, the, the, the market operation and may bring in uh, even more benefits. How prepared are we? Is there any intention or is there any initiative regarding allowing intermediary companies to come into the market in the, given the proliferation of renewable energy in, in, in the market? Okay. 
so we have four questions well four people asking a lot of questions um but most of them are to miss uh, Masetti. so i'm gonna ask the other gentlemen the gentlemen to do their bit and then when you get your mic then you can vote out there um so i think there was uh, um from mr zimu he had asked um a uh, question to CSIR, Savia, and Power Africa. So can we get those, and then um, we'll get the others, and then Ms. Masetti will be the last one to answer all the NESA questions. Thank you, program. Thank you, program manager. <coughs> I think just to uh, address Silas, I think when we started this initiative, uh, there was a confusion with the CETAs, or there was a restructure of the CETAs. And at that time, we had been placed with MERS CETA. So a lot of the work that we have done has Masita as the quality partner, and we are trying to bring in EW CETA, but Masita is the CETA that we are using uh, with QCTO and SACWA. Uh, in terms of the question with regards to sign-off, we actually had in-depth discussions in terms of the sign-off of the PV Green Card. So firstly, the PV Green Card mechanism is a full quality mechanism. The green card itself is not issued to an installer. It is not a license to operate. It is rather a document that's handed over to the end con a consumer. So it's a documentation of the system that's your actual PV green card. In terms of the sign off, through the PV green card uh, platform, we ask for, we give you a checklist that you have to comply with to issue that PV green card to your customer. One of it is a design that has been signed off by uh, an, a design engineer. Right, so that's where we cover the designers of the system. The actual PV green card, the declaration of the PV green card is in terms of the installation <laughs> or the wiring more so. So the electrician who's doing the installation needs to be um, upskilled to be able to sign off that declaration. We've also taken into consideration how uh, companies operate in the space and we've allowed for two different people to sign that declaration one who is the assessed person through the SAPIA pro, uh, program, and the other one being the electrician that is registered with, with, uh, with the Department of Labor. So it can have two sign-offs, giving you the same kind of um, capa uh, capability that is required or suitably qualified to actually sign up that installation. Yeah. Um, I think whilst the mic is that side, maybe let's uh, get the Africa, Power Africa answer. I'm glad Nurse is here today, <laughs> as are you, apparently. Um, <clears throat> just uh, y your comment, uh, Silas, about you know our, our work in rural areas. Well, what about the areas that are within urban spaces that may not have access to electricity as well? We have a lot of grid densification activities going on. We have a lot of off-grid activities that are um, also focused in urban areas. We have right now, uh, for example, a program going on with the city of Windhoek that is trying to actually extend the grid to um, these unofficial settlements that have set up around uh, the city of Windhoek. We, um, this also gets to what I was talking about with this uh, Smart Communities Coalition, our work in refugee camps. It's exactly the situation where you have a dense population without any access to the grid, and what are we doing there? Um, in this case, we did, in that particular case, one of the other things we did was we did some market studies for these solar home system companies. We're actually looking at that as well, in addition to the mini grids, um, to sort of identify, um, you know, population centers, business centers, commercial centers within the refugee camp so that they could go in uh, not having to spend money on that initial analysis to sort of help de-risk and lower the cost for their entry into the market. Um, uh, we, I was, uh, when I was in Uganda three weeks ago, I also was part of a, I went to, to visit a home where we've developed uh, with one of our contractors a, a new product, a new, a new, it's a new way of wiring a home so that they're ready to receive a connection because the government of Uganda has a new program where they're installing or they're connecting millions of people to the grid but most of these people can't afford the wiring in the home to be able to receive the connection. And so we've got a pilot now that, that is introducing a new way to do that that's reduced the cost from roughly 100 US dollars per connection down to about 40. And so now they can afford to be able to wire their home and receive that connection more readily. So the answer is 
we have a toolbox, right? If you go on our website, there's a toolbox that discusses all the different resources and programs that we have through our partners, through the U.S. government, to be able to address all of these particular issues as they come up. And so we, we, we want to be a one-stop shop where if you have a question about something in particular, you can contact anybody on our team and we will get you to the right person that might be able to help solve your problem. Thank you so much, Richard. Clinton? Um, maybe, Silas, to your, your point in terms of ESCOM's role, it's not just about municipalities. Thanks for making that observation. Um, I think it really also talks to the, the, the design of our, of, our, of our ESI and the unbundling of ESCOM because inherently there's also conflict of interest. Um, it would be very painful for a developer to be told that they can't connect 500 kilowatt PV installation in a particular part of the ESCOM grid um, because there's no capacity and six months later see ESCOM breaking ground to put their own PV installation up there. So, so it, it can be done, it should be done. There's many jurisdictions where that is, where municipalities have an energy business, where they do exactly that. They've got, you've got waste, you've got landfill that you can divert, turn that through biogas into electricity. You can take uh, waste through, through water treatment plants, turn that into, so there's lots of opportunities, but it needs to be done responsibly, and I think the market design around those things so that it's a fair level playing field is, is critical. Um, and then, Janet, to your point in terms of um, the technical impacts, yes, we as a CSI have been in touch with uh, the ESCOM system operator. Um, as part of our own system analysis, um, we've also looked at things such as uh, system inertia and when we think that those things will start to become a constraint. I think the really good news is that we have a very good, well-managed and operated system operator and transmission grid in South Africa. Um, and even with increasing renewables penetration, there will be localized issues and challenges where you have high levels of concentration. But um, from a system level, we really only expect um, some of these uh, challenges to require some, some new thinking beyond 2030. So we have more than 10 years um, to start to bend down the technical solutions as part of the energy transition. Um, where I think we will end up with challenges is localized areas in certain um, built-up um, high-income affluent um, Gulf estate equivalents where you're going to have a whole lot of people buying electric vehicles, putting PV on their rooftops, and those localized distribution networks, I think, where we'll first start to see some of these challenges. We won't start to see them at the system level for, for quite some years to come. But it is real. It will need to be properly managed, and we as a CSR are responsibly engaged with the system operator and with ESCOM research to put together a portfolio of proactive research to say, what will those challenges be? What will the solutions be? How, uh, how, how will we as a country solve them? Oh, I get it. It was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, Tabang. Um, there was a question about um, engagements uh, with ESCOM as well as the um, NSPs. Um, there hasn't been a sort of a, a, um, a, a concerted um, effort, so to speak, to um, engage with ESCOM in this uh, with regards to embedded generation. Um, I've started engagements. I think uh, there was a workshop that we organized. Uh, it was end of May for, for the first time. So after we've had some processes that were approved by the regulator. But I think there's a, there's a need to engage with ESCOM and understand exactly what ESCOM needs and, uh, and, and also the requirements for this letter of connection and all of that. Um, so I, I think it's a, it, it, it should be an ongoing thing because we've just started some of the processes and other people still don't understand certain things such as some limitations that are put out there. We also from our side uh, have certain things that we would like to clarify with the department um, with regards to the letter from the minister as well so that we are all aligned. So um, it's going to be a two-way process in the sense that the regulator may need to also engage with the department, clarify certain things so that we can also be able to provide answers and, and clarity to, to the industry players. Now, with, uh, uh, with regards to these uh, engagements, I think they're quite crucial. 
engagements are quite important. And uh, I think uh, NERSA should actually um, do more of these engagements because uh, that once off is not helpful. Uh, it's important that we engage more with, uh, with the relevant uh, parties uh, in the industry, including ESCOM itself. With regards to the, um, uh, to, to the delays and why do we require this letter of connection? I mean, this is, this, is the, this is an infrastructure owned by the distributor. So you want to connect into the distribution system that is owned by someone. So it's sort of a third party access, really, because you need access there. You need to also know where this is going to be. And there was another question, actually, regarding the impact on the um, uh, stability of the grid. So that also is quite important. So you can't just go and connect into somebody's infrastructure with that, without that person knowing and what is needed. So those things about the stability of the grid and you're going to connect into that distri distribution system, it's, it's quite important that therefore notify the party that owns that system. So that is why then we will need the letter from ESCOM so that it is aware that there's a party that is going to embed some units into its distribution uh, system, if it's ESCOM or if it's the municipality. So that will be uh, one of the reasons why. And also, uh, the act, one of the objectives is about the orderly development of the industry. So we also need to know these things. If there are also some thresholds that are stipulated uh, in the IRP, if we do not know where they are and how much is generated and we're not going to get some, when we do some monitoring to check, oh, how much are the actual megawatts that were generated out of this? So we need to also collate that information. That information will help us then to aggregate all of those and see if we have now met the 500 megawatts that is stipulated in the IRP or it is stipulated elsewhere. So those things are quite important when we do our monitoring as well and put those things together. So ESCOM or municipality will also assist us in obtaining that kind of information. Um, the one about um, which one comes first, I think these engagements are quite important. Is it the registration or is it the letter from ESCOM? Remember, one of the requirements from our side, as, and if you um, give regard to the answer that I've just provided, that you can't just connect into somebody's uh, infrastructure without uh, notifying that person, and for various reasons. So we do need that letter of connection. As to the conduct of a party that owns the infrastructure, and therefore that party may then employ certain tactics to delay and that is something else. Remember now, it is the conduct of a party that is then dominant and is, is owning the, the critical infrastructure. So that then becomes also the, um, something that the regulator must then look at. Because the purpose of regulation, you are actually regulating the actions or the conduct of the party that then that is the, that is dominant and may exercise market power over that critical infrastructure so that then becomes the role of the regulator to really regulate that conduct that is shown by that party that's the main purpose to really try and control that power that is exercised by the party so here really you want others that want to invest to then tap onto that uh, infrastructure, which is your third party access, so to speak, onto that infrastructure or the interconnection to that infrastructure. Now the last question, or oh, then the question which one comes first, uh, you know, we still need to uh, facilitate the processes because from our side we want to see the connection and uh, ESCOM says we want registration. You can't have registration when you have not sorted out what do you register if you cannot, uh, you don't know whether you're going to be connected or not connected. So those are some of the things that I'm saying could also be part of the ongoing engagements with the relevant uh, stakeholders. Um, I'm not sure if I'm missing any uh, question. How prepared are we to regulate the intermediaries? Intermediaries, I take it that you're also referring to the resellers themselves uh, that are proliferating in the market. If you recall about two or three years ago, we published um, 
uh, draft roles and those draft roles in, uh, they also had to do with the resellers themselves and there were certain proposals that but they were not implemented so it's something that we said let's look carefully at it and how best can we regulate them if we need to regulate them and how is it going to be done because you also don't want to regulate for the sake of regulating uh, you also want to make sure that you uh, you, you 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 regulate efficiently and you regulate where it is needed for you to regulate. So, so the issue of the resellers and intermediaries is not something that we have not uh, given attention to. And the fact that we published before a consultation paper on the proposed rules on how we can actually uh, monitor the resellers, it is something that shows that the regulator is looking into that the emergence of the resellers and some of which they've been in the market and it might actually grow that actually that market so what is it that we are going to regulate exactly we need to know and uh, what is the purpose of regulating so that we make sure that we make a greater impact and we deal with the problem if there is a problem you don't regulate if there is no problem so if there is a problem and we need to also um, um, uh, you know check things that we need to check as a regulator then we will do it in the way that is also proposed by stakeholders themselves to say, Nersa, we think that you could have a, a role to play here and your role should be limited so that you don't overregulate. So those are the things that will come to stakeholders and, and, and uh, consult further. We thought let, let us sort of slow down on that until we engage sufficiently um, or meaningfully so that we can understand exactly what stakeholders want to see. Thank you. As uh, Richard said, yo, we are happy you are here. Okay, there is a uh, last round now um, that is going. So, um, Chris, are you allowed to ask a question? I hope so. Okay, okay, wait, can I see hands first? Um, okay, um, all right, there are two hands there at the back, three, four. Where? Okay, fine. You? Okay, all right. Um, Chris, you'll be last. Yes, um, so let's start one, two, three, uh, think four, and then five, and then you are last. Then, then um, know that you are between us and lunch. Yes, okay. Thanks. This time, Paul Vermeulen, but from South African Energy Storage Association. <laughs> if I can ask the regulator to clarify, say, for example, a half a megawatt uh, battery that's not linked to a PV system. In other words, it's a battery system that's there in place of a diesel generator. Is that a registration process or is it a licensing process? And if we've got a customer with a one megawatt or more battery, how do we deal that? Or if we are interested in putting in an energy storage system in a suburb, for example, of two megawatts big, must we have it licensed or is it a registration? In other words, is storage treated separately as, as small-scale embedded generation, or is it all lumped together? Thanks. <coughs> Thank you for the question. There's a hand at the back there. Hi, Clyde, <coughs> Clyde Madison, Virtual Energy and Power. I have a, a, an associate question to the battery storage. Um, first of all, the, the question is the same, how are batteries treated? But secondly, if I moderate the output from a facility so it never exceeds 10 megawatts and it comes via a battery portal, could I effectively install more than 10 megawatts of supply that would feed to that battery that would never deliver more than 10 megawatts to the system? Thank you. Thank you. I think there was still another hand there at the back and then we come this side. My name is Lenyatso from Mani Industries. Uh, the gentleman from SAPAVVI, you indicated that the specification is not ready and is going to be under uh, sense 10142-2 and it will be slash one. So, uh, that is for medium volt. Ten one four two dash two is for medium voltage, and ten one four two dash one is for low voltage systems. So, 
why is the spec for embedded generation why is it going to be under 10 142 dash uh two dash one why is it going to be under dash two so which is medium voltage i i believe that uh your spec will cover both possibly low voltage and me medium voltage so just wondering why it's not maybe 10 one four two uh dash three thank you um mr Gavenda. i hope you understood that i understood nothing <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, please answer correctly. Um, there's a question this sure. side. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Alex Winning from Reuters News Agency. The first question um, is, if I understand the gentleman from the CSIR correctly, a lot of this has been going on under the radar. So are we saying that there's a lot of SSEG installed out there in South Africa, which is neither registered or licensed? with NERSA, and I'm not just talking about like a couple of panels on a roof, but I'm potentially talking about, you know, small businesses or other people that have, um, you know, s relatively large systems installed that haven't gone, gone through the, the, the proper processes. And, and what do you think about that? The second question is, is that speaking to a lot of people in the industry, they mentioned politics as a factor here. To what extent do you think politics and ideology is constraining the growth of this sector? Uh, and I'm talking in government, I'm talking the problems that we see with ESCOM, talking about unions and coal mining jobs. Um, there are obviously de technical delays that you come across, uh, um, but to what extent is politics a factor here? Thank you. To, to whom is that last question? Uh, it's also, well, to, I think, to, you know, NERSA and the CSIR and, and Sapvia, anyone else who yeah, <laughs> wants to... Uh... Yes. Okay. Um, did we exhaust everything there? Then we can give our uh, co-host uh, a chance. Uh, thank you, Chris Yellen, E Publishers. Uh, just to bring this back to the money, um, and my question is uh, not to the panel itself, uh, but to the audience, uh, and in particular to the DBSA, who have got quite a, a significant number of uh, delegates here today. I read uh, from a press release of yours that you had been given a grant or of a hundred, sorry, of, of yeah, hundred million US dollar. Uh, for small-scale embedded generation in South Africa, and this was matched by other development financial institutions of another hundred million US dollars, and then there was going to be some crowdsourcing from the commercial banks of another hundred million US dollars, taking it to three hundred million US dollars, which is about three and a half billion rand. Um, I, I, can you just elaborate about? Uh, the purpose of this finance and how you will channel this uh, to the sector, the small-scale embedded generation sector in South Africa, or have I got it all wrong? But I did get this from a, a DBSA press release, so hopefully it's not wrong. I'm told it was an old one. <laughs> okay. Um, answers, answers, answers. Um, okay. Shall we start with Nessa this time? And then you can rest whilst the others are answering. Thank you. Um, the two questions, they have to do with storage. Uh, if you look at the, um, the main provision of the act from my slides, the, the wording of that uh, section is very clear. It's, it talks about what you license, you license the operation of transmission, um, generation, transmission, and distribution. So it's the operation of those. So you can see uh, storage is not included. It's not going hand in hand with those. So you've got transmission as a separate activity. That's, that's the point I want to make. Distribution as well as generation as a, as a separate activity. So storage for the sake, for the purpose, main purpose of storing, it's a different activity altogether. So it's not a transmission. It's not something that is lumped into transmission or the, or the meaning of transmission or generation. So it, from this then, it is very clear that 
um, if there's going to be any licensing of storage or uh, registration of storage, which is not mentioned as such in the in the in the notice in any event, um, uh, in in terms of um, the regulatory framework that should uh, uh, regulate the battery storage or other storage uh, technologies. So um, storage will have to be a to be treated as a separate activity. That is the straightforward answer. It it has to be treated as a separate activity. It's not distribution. It's not transmission. It's not generation. So the answer is that it is storage, and what you store, you put it there for storage purposes. So it's a, it's a, it's a storage on its own, and you get that also from other legislation at NERSA, from gas side, from the petroleum uh, pipeline side that licenses the storage infrastructure. So when it comes to electricity then, uh, but you must also remember, and this is something that was uh, discussed last, was it last week or two weeks ago, Richard, when we were in uh, the same panel in Lisbon on the Africa Energy Forum. So uh, the, it's, it's about uh, the role of regulators uh, in regulating the sort of the battery storage to what extent and what is it that you need to regulate and at what point do you think that it will be crucial for regulators to get involved in the regulation of uh, battery storage or other energy storage technologies. So you need to come up with something that will be efficient and that will facilitate investment because there's a number of things. Some of them were talking about um, the the lifespan of the uh, battery technology itself. Others, they will say it varies, for, it varies from five to, um, uh, to to whatever, 15 years, 20 years, and all of that, and the maintenance of it as well, cost associated with it, because you need to recoup your capex and all of those things. So the role of the regulator then, all of those kind of things. So the reason I'm getting into this is the fact that we, we, we don't have a uh, sort of a framework or regulatory framework currently that regulates battery storage or any energy storage when it comes to electricity. It's not there. When it comes to gas, we We've got it when it comes to gas, as well as the petroleum pipelines. But when it comes to this new area, we don't have a regulatory framework. So I just wanted to clarify that and uh, um, by you know, um, explaining all those things that are still a concern, not only here, but also outside of uh, South Africa. So Clyde, yes, uh, storage, uh, it's a separate activity, and uh, I think we need to look carefully into the role of the regulator and what the regulator needs to do. And if you regulate there, it must be efficient and it must be, you don't want to um, impose too much of a regulatory burden when it comes to that such that then it impedes investment. But to the extent that the, 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 there's a role, that role must also be checked with investors. And that's the message that was also coming out there, that investors as well and people that are developing the technology, I think it's quite important that you understand exactly regulators don't just come and say, we're going to want to uh, regulate everything. Understand what is it that you want to regulate, why you regulate it, what, uh, and when you regulate, remember you want to also facilitate investment. What if you just regulate and there are industry players, experts in the, in the field that know how these things work, and then you just regulate for the sake of regulating and you put or the department comes in there put a certain language that will actually impede um, the, um, the uh, investment in that specific area um, do I have another question I think that was the question I don't think I have any other I'm not uh, answering the question around uh, the politics uh, um, the regulator is reporting to the department and to Parliament so I can't uh, answer that one, but CSIR can do that. As a regulator, we don't pronounce. So my shareholder is the DST, so I also report to Parliament. So <laughs> who am I going to hand the, the microphone to? Um, so Alex, um, your question in terms of how many are sort of legally registered, uh, we don't know. Um, we do know, for example, look, I know of, you know, people that I know that have installed it and they say, well, you know, we've just done it and we haven't let the municipality know. Uh, City of Cape Town have recently had a process to legalize, in inverted commas, installations in terms of giving, giving the residents of the city there uh, a time frame by when mandatory registration of all of those rooftop installations is required. Um, in, in, in many cases, responsible uh, distributors will require the tariff to change. Um, to have a fire, higher fixed portion of the tariff, which is perfectly reasonable. 
um, and there is then a, a, an incentive for customers to not register. They will not want to go on to the, 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 challenge bec the, the change tariff because their business case changes. Um, and we, we unfortunately do live in a country where, where um, adherence to, to, to the rule of law um, is perhaps uh, questionable. Um, so what do we as the CSR think about it? Um, you don't want to be the person that ends up electrocuting someone and going to jail. I mean, it's as serious as that. Um, the, the operation of those distribution grids can be compromised. The, the installations must be professionally done and they must be properly registered. Um, and where's the CSR fully support the department and NOSA in terms of registering installations? You cannot live in a country like ours with the renewable resource and the rooftop PV space that's going to, to, to play out without knowing where they are and exactly how big they are, um, who's installed them and the sizes and the capacities. We're not going to be able to economically and technically operate our grid without having that information, so it must be done. Um, we're an organization that can spot a one millimeter change in deformation of the land from, from space in terms of from satellites. So it's probably not too far off before we'll be able to pick up the fact that you have a, a, a PV on your roof um, automatically using AI and the like and be able to raise red flags. So those kinds of, of intelligent technologies will probably come out and help, help regulate the process But because it will have to be done. We have to register them which really talks to the, the, the politics of some of the discussion that happens, you know. Um, and, and, and we totally understand the psyche of the consumer, you know, having gone through load shedding and everything that has happened in a country, the, the increase in tariffs, I mean, there is a level of, of resistance um, and, and people understandably wanting to say, but now our nurse, I want to tax the sun, you know. They want to uh, be able to, uh, uh, you know, raise a registration fee. It's, it's just another tax. A lot of that stems from not having these kinds, enough of these kinds of discussions, but, but with, with the less informed. I mean, the people in the room understand most of what we're talking about. We, we're talking to an informed audience, but most people wouldn't, wouldn't understand why it's necessary, for example, to register installations. So I think there's a lot of consumer education that is required um, in the space, and I think the work through the likes of SAPVIA and Green Cards and NERSA it, it all needs to be steered and coordinated um, because energy and politics are intertwined. They always, they always have been. They probably always will be. Um, but we need to do things responsibly, and the CSR will be part of that. Alex, you got your answer, ne? The politics, uh, politics was answered. Eh? Okay. So I think representing industry, I can vent on the politics of the matter. <laughs> no, I'm not going to. <laughs> So just to answer the um, standards question, according to the stands codes, um, so I have to admit there hasn't been a decision as to where this code would fit, so it's the wiring of SSEG. Uh, our submission or our recommendation is that it fits under the SANS 10142-1 series, uh, given the fact that uh, Department of Labor and Occupational Health and Safety Act consider PV installations as an electrical installation. And if we didn't include it under the, the one series, then they would have to relook at the regulations within the Department of Labor and the sign off on the COC. So our recommendation was to include it under the, the dash one series, so it would automatically be accepted by the Department of Labor and not have us wait another year for them to do that. Um, yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, you have about two minutes to <laughs> Just give it a wrap up, um, and as we are racing towards, oh, the DBS, yo, oh, they nearly got away, Scott free. Ooh, okay, DBSA people, um, Chris knows you, so if you don't answer, you'll hound you. <laughs> okay, great. Sorry about that. Okay, thought we got away with it. Um, I was looking for my boss, but I think he went out for five kilometer walk <laughs> yes so in feb we got a um, 100 million usd um funding for embedded generation um from gcf and dbsa will be also providing the 100 million um usd funding as well 
Uh, in addition to that, it's correct, we'll be uh, also catalyzing or crowding in the commercial banks to participate. And one of the requirements of that um, funding is that the, the, the embedded generation, it's for, it's, for, um, it's for the production of energy from one megawatt to 10 megawatts. So if you're less than one megawatt, you don't qualify. But um, currently, so one of the conditions um, currently, because we couldn't um, sign the agreement with GCF at that time without the IRP uh, being approved. So after receiving the letter, after hearing about the letter from uh, the Minister of Energy, we've been uh, talking with uh, GCF again in terms of trying to finalize those, those agreements and trying to bet down the conditions, which we hope it will be finalized before the end of this year. So once it has been finalized, then DBSA will do a launch to communicate with interested parties in terms of the conditions that you need to meet in order to qualify for that funding. Excellent. At least it gave you some time to wrap up in your minds, your, your last thoughts. Um, shall we start with you? Well, I think, um Firstly, thanks to the organizers um, and my fellow pan panel members. Um, good discussion. Um, uh, SSEG is, is here. It's real. Um, whether we like it or not, consumers are going to do it. I think our challenge is to make sure that it's done responsibly and that no one gets left behind in the process. Um, and that um, the design of our industry, the tariffs, th there's a lot of big picture things that need to be done. But we also don't need to wait for some of those things in order, you know, there's some simple things that can be done um, to allow this industry to, to, to boom um, and to start to drive the localization of those technologies. Uh, I think from the CSR perspective, we see a huge potential, but we are concerned that there you know, needs to be a concerted approach that's going to allow us to, to manufacture and localize those technologies in South Africa. So, so you know, a lot of the debate needs to move from is it going to happen and how much will happen to, okay, it's here, how are we going to really benefit this? How's, how's it become part of, of, of what we do and, and really adds value um, and provides solutions for, for all sectors of the economy? It, it may be that some sectors of, of, of our electricity consumer base are not going to have rooftop PV on their roofs, the, the construction of their, their roofs, the the sad reality of the housing that they live in is not going to be conducive to that, but if they can be benefiting from the economic stimuli and the jobs and the other things that get created in those industries, that's a huge benefit. So I think the whole drive around localization of this market, um, it really plays to being able to localize these technologies. I think that needs to be a key driver going forward. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, I think the one thing that I would like to emphasize is that um, it is important for all of us to understand the legal requirements so that we can be able to avoid confusion and, uh, and, and, and interpreting things uh, that are not in line with what the law requires of us, especially for NERSA. Um, the whole thing about the SSEGs and uh, what was expected for registration purposes. I think there was a lot of confusion and uh, I, I think also maybe from our side it was important right after the minister gazetted the notice that perhaps we should have gone out there and engaged stakeholders and also put out there the requirements. That was done later and it's important for us to acknowledge that it was not done in time. Uh, it took a bit of time to put processes in place, so we acknowledge that, but I think it is, uh, it is quite important uh, that we at least clarify the legal requirements. Because nobody understood that you don't just take an application and therefore it's a tick box and it is done. It is the process, and please understand also that uh, the, the regulator is required in terms of the National Energy Regulator Act of 2004 that Every decision that you take, you must consult. It, it states clearly there. So you could also be challenged if you don't. I mean, look at the Earth Life uh, case as well. That before you take a decision, you must consult. So some of those things, some, sometimes they, um, 
they uh, uh, sort of lost somewhere in the frustration that is actually exhibited by industry players that expected certain actions to say the regulator is supposed to do this. Now that the minister has done this, are you going to do this by tomorrow? You can't do that by tomorrow because we're a creature of statute. We don't have any discretion to deviate from what the law requires of us. So that's the message really I want to emphasize. The second thing is that um, the regulator is there to make sure that some of these investments they do actually um, uh, come into fruition. They, 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 they should be you know, facilitated by the regulator. That is why we are there and our objectives or one of the objectives of the act is to facilitate investment, but also facilitate investment that are going to result in efficiency. So efficient investment, uh, responsible investments, it's what we are here for. And again, one of the things that we are driving, we, we appreciate the, um, the developments in the sector. They are changing the way things are done in that sector. They are changing also the structure of the market. As it changes the structure of the market, it's something that we welcome because it then introduces competition, something that was not there. Remember what we are doing as the regulator. We regulate to ensure that there are competitive outcomes. So we'll always appreciate the fact that they are now SSSGs, they are going to contribute positively into our economy in terms of the shortage of electricity, but not only that, the fact that sometimes ESCOM is not able to produce certain megawatts or to meet certain demand, but then you can get it through um, the, uh, the other generators, independent generators. So we appreciate that um, uh, aspect of competition into the market because it is our role. The other thing that I want to emphasize is that going forward, and I'm hoping that, Chris, this is not the end. Perhaps some follow-up session is quite important so that we can see progress uh, in what we have started and the, and, and the boom of these SSSGs, including maybe the battery storage uh, thing. Maybe it's another session that you probably need to organize so that we can see to what extent what can be regulated if it needs to be regulated and, uh, and, and look into a number of things like these other challenges people are talking about in terms of maintenance, in terms of the fact that some of them may not even last for five years. They may last um, less and you need to put a cost for that. So, that we, so there's a number of things that you need to take into uh, consideration. But the other thing that the industry should also uh, keep in mind is how we collate information. You know, it's a very important, the um, data management. How do we collate information about these SSEGs uh, in terms of the total installed capacity? If, for instance, now there is um, this, this 500 megawatts that is mentioned, that is in the um, uh, recent uh, IRP draft, how do we make sure that, and who's going to do that, to collate all that information and keep that data and make sure that whatever is installed out there what is registered is separately, but what is licensed, which must get to that 500 megawatts, who's going to keep that information? Who's, go who's going to make sure that that information gets collated and also those that are generating will bring that information to the relevant body? Uh, to keep that information because that becomes important because you also feed back to the department to say, this is where we are. That 500 megawatts was very small. You know, the industry wants more. Say you want 1,000 megawatts. You know what I mean? So they probably don't know uh, even themselves why they chose 500 megawatts. What are the basis of 500 megawatts? Initially it was 200, now it's 500. Why not 1,000? I'm just, you know, making an example. So sometimes some of those things is, are things that as an industry you can engage on and say maybe as, as, so, as, as a start we need 1,000 megawatts and then let's manage the data around it and let's publish it so that everybody has uh, that information. I think that's, um, that's all that I would like to, um, to, uh, you know, to, to share. And uh, I think some of the other things like um, uh, clarity on how we regulate and uh, as we move forward, uh, we also intend to have the workshops and uh, also the frequently asked questions. We can have a summary of that and keep on developing from those things so that everybody understands, you know, what is our role, where does it start, and what are some of the things that, or the way that we uh, look into certain things that stakeholders would like to get clarity on through the frequently asked questions, and we can always keep on changing them. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Program Director. Um, I think if we go back four or five years, when SSEG started to become popular, it started be to, become, uh, to become a topic that was discussed. We had no laws and policies that could discuss it. We had no regulations in place. We had no standards. We had no processes. We had no qualifications. We definitely did not have municipal buy-in. Buy we had municipalities saying that it will never happen. Today, we have discussions and platforms like this where we do have policies that talk about SSEG, the IRP under uh, consideration having an allocation for SSEG. We have the Electricity Regulation Act Schedule 2, which talks about how you can be exempt from licensing on these things. We have NERSA around the table talking about the regulations and how this needs to be reg uh, regulated in a, in a positive manner. We have standards in place, a draft ready with, this, with the standard of bureaus. We have processes with, I think 25% of our municipalities have application processes for SSEG in place. So you are able to do this. We have qualifications, a national qualification that has been registered. Um, and we have a lot more political buy-in. So to answer that question, we do have a lot more political buy-in. So you can see how the landscape has changed over the four, four, four or five years that we've been going through. As Sophia, we've played a role in making sure that all of these components were in place to ensure that the market was open for industry players. We still promote PV, we still promote uh, small-scale embedded generation PV, rooftop PV, but we promote this safely, legally, responsibly, and sustainably. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll build on your point in just a moment, but I will say something about the politics. Uh, um, because we have a we have a, a, a view of the entire continent and how politics kind of plays into every every jurisdiction. I was at a, a conference about a year ago. I can't even remember where, and I can't even remember who said it. But one of the speakers made a point, and I'm not sure I agree with it entirely. But it was an interesting point. He said the reason why there are less than thirty percent of the people living in sub-Saharan Africa who do not have power, it's a political decision. He said, it's all politics. And he goes, if, if there was political will, they could change it. Now, obviously, it's not that easy, um, but there's a lot of truth to that statement. Um, so I actually find it refreshing to be here today to hear about the progress that South Africa is making. I love what you were just talking about, enumerating the progress that's been made in this particular area over the last four or five years. And as uh, uh, an initiative that has a sub-Saharan African wide mandate, we are looking at South Africa to sort of continue to lead in this uh, area. Hopefully we'll be able to make major progress going forward and be able to replicate that in other, other countries that we're working in. Uh, we may be calling on you to help uh, go to other places and help educate them as well. So congratulations on the, the progress that you're making and, and uh, let's keep moving forward. Thank you.